Ontario's Progress Toward Fully Accessible Transportation for People with Disabilities. David Lepofsky, Chair, Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act Alliance. Delivered at the Osgoode Hall Law School, January 23, 2014, as a Roy McMurtry Clinical Fellow. Good morning, everyone. Um, today's lecture is going to focus on the Campaign for Accessible Public Transportation uh, for People with Disabilities in the Province of Ontario. My name is David Lepofsky. I'm Chair of the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act Alliance, and I'm, I'm very honored to be able to present to uh, this uh, policy course in the Critical Disability Studies program. I want to talk to you about why public transportation matters, about the kind of problems that people with disabilities face using it, uh, about the kind of resistance we've faced trying to achieve full accessibility in public transit, and then I want to take you through the gains made or sought but not made under the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act. And I'm going to conclude with some remarks about recent developments and upcoming events on the tr public transportation front. You should consider public transportation a really good case study in the battle for accessibility. It isn't always this vexing. Uh, we don't meet as much resistance in each sector as we have here. But each sector we take on is important and each battle in one way or another has its own dynamic. So what's the problem? Uh, we have uh, at least 1.8 million people with disabilities in Ontario, over 4 million in Canada, and many more will get disabilities, virtually everybody as they age. They face too many barriers in society, and our public transit system is one example. Our public transit system was not originally designed to accommodate and include people with disabilities. That's crazy. It's not like we just invented people with disabilities in 2005 or even in 1982. However, we still face too many barriers. Barriers getting into stations, barriers getting onto vehicles, barriers knowing where we are on the vehicle or what stop we're at on the route, barriers getting service, barriers with fee structures, uh, barriers uh, with public paratransit for those who can't use the, the conventional transit system, getting a ride, uh, getting to where you want to go and getting there in a timely fashion. Far too many barriers. They're not all physical barriers. The first thing you might think of are steps to get into a uh, subway station uh, or onto a bus that impede people with mobility disabilities, but I as a blind person I have faced barriers finding out what stop I'm at. More about that uh, in a moment. People with hearing loss face difficulty knowing what's being announced over the public address system where it's not displayed in text form on a video screen. Uh, some of the barriers are old, like subway stations built in the 50s, and some are brand new like the spanking new Presto smart card for paying your public transit fares, a system designed with barriers included. I'll talk about that right near the end of my presentation. How do we take on these barriers? Historically, the only way we could was by bringing claims under the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which guarantees equality without discrimination, based on physical or mental disability. That applies to all governments, federal, provincial, municipal, including municipal public transit authorities. We could also file individual claims of discrimination under the Ontario Human Rights Code. It guarantees the right to goods, services, and facilities without discrimination based on disability. And both the Charter and the Human Rights Code impose on all organizations, including 
transit providers, a duty to accommodate the needs of people with disabilities up to the point of undue hardship if equal service is not being provided. Put simply, these barriers I've described are at some way or in some way pretty much all illegal. It may take time to remove them and it should take no time to prevent the creation of new ones, but they got to go. The problem historically was that if you had to enforce these one barrier at a time, one complaint at a time, one transit authority at a time, one individual with a disability bringing claims at a time, the burden of enforcing them was just far too heavy. That's what led a number of us in 1994 to argue that we needed a new law to systematically require the removal and prevention of these kind of barriers without us having to litigate them one at a time. I had the privilege of leading the coalition that fought for a decade and won that law, the Ontarians with Disabilities Act Committee. The law that we won in 2005 is called the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act, or AODA. I now have the privilege of leading the successor coalition, these are all volunteer roles, of volunteer coalitions that are nonpartisan. The Accessibility for Ontarians with Disability Act Alliance uh, campaigns to get the Disabilities Act effectively implemented. Let me zero in on public transit. Why is it so important? It's hugely important. It's hugely important because getting around is vital if you're going to get a job and keep a job, if you're going to get an education, if you're going to get to the doctor or the grocery store, for many, many people who don't or can't drive or afford their own car. Well, some people with disabilities can't drive. I'm one of them. Being totally blind, you don't want me driving. So for us, unless you've got someone to drive you, the TTC, the public transit system, I'm going to talk a lot about TTC because we're in Toronto and that's where I live, but it's, it's our car. Unless you've got a family member or, uh, or, or uh, access to taxis or whatever, uh, it's your car. And without an education, you can't get to school, to university, you're gonna, you're not going to get an education. You don't get an education, you're going to have trouble getting a job. And even if you get an education, if you can't get to that job, you're not going to be able to be interviewed and then win the job and then keep it. It's all pretty obvious. Access to public transit is vital to be able to take part in, in the mainstream of life. For other people with disabilities, they may be able to drive, but they can't afford a car. What we know about people with disabilities is that we're large in number but we're also substantially overrepresented among the unemployed or underemployed. We're substantially overrepresented among the welfare dependent and the poor. So buying a car for a number of them is out of the question. Moreover, cars are not designed to accommodate people with certain kinds of disabilities. And for them, they may need a specialized, specially designed vehicle and to buy that may be way more expensive than an already expensive conventional car. Also potentially out of their financial reach if they're among the many people with disabilities who are unemployed, underemployed, poor, and or socially dependent, social assistance dependent. These barriers hurt everyone. Nobody benefits from the barriers in our public transit system. They hurt people with disabilities by driving, helping drive or keep people with disabilities into a state of unemployment or poverty. They force more of them to become uh, social assistant dependent. Not just the barriers in, in transportation alone drive them into this condition. They contribute to the disadvantage uh, that leads to this, uh, uh, this economic end result. It ends up with society not benefiting from as many people with disabilities contributing as, as employees and as workers. And it puts a greater social assistance burden on society. It also hurts our society because businesses don't get the benefit of their skills if they can't get there or can't get an education or can't get a job. 
Similarly, these kind of barriers hurt us economically because if you can't get to a store, you can't spend your money there. So if a person with a disability can only get to the stores immediately near them, that means that other stores and other services that might benefit from their, them as customers don't get the chance. And finally, it undermines your community as a tourism destination. Tourists with disabilities like to travel like anywhere else, but they're going to pick a city that's got accessible public transit uh, over a city that doesn't in making their choices whenever they can. There are a billion people with disabilities around the world. Not all of them are going to come to a particular city in, in Ontario, but within them, there's a lot of spending power that we'd benefit from having, and with inaccessible public transit or transit barriers, we make ourselves an unattractive tourist destination for them. And that hurts everybody. Well, how hard should it be to achieve an accessible public transit system? Well, I'd like to suggest to you that it actually shouldn't be hard at all. At one level, you might say, oh, well, we're talking about a lot of buses, a lot of subway cars and stations, and man, if, we, if they're not accessible to change that all, that's got to be a huge pile of money. It should be tough. But here's why it shouldn't be hard. Number one, we all have a financial interest, collectively as a society, in having an accessible public transit system because it helps our economy across the board. We all have an individual interest in it because if you don't have a disability now, you're likely going to get one later. And even if you don't have one now, you've got friends or family who do. And when you're going to go out for the afternoon or the evening, if you're going with a person with a mobility disability who can't get on, uh, can't use a particular subway station or, or bus or whatever, you're not going to say to them, well, let's go to a movie together. You figure out how you're getting there. I'll see you if you make it. You want to travel together. That's what going out together is all about. So we all have an interest in it. Moreover, the organizations that deliver public transit are large organizations. They're not mom and pop operations rubbing two nickels together to just try to get by. They're mainly large organizations. I'll talk separately about taxis later. Moreover, the equipment they use is not eternal. They have to replace it over time. And if they replace inaccessible vehicles with accessible ones, and inaccessible equipment with accessible equipment over time, we can get away from this problem over time. It's also a problem that we should be able to solve relatively uh, readily because the organizations, at least those that deliver public transit, are nonprofit public sector organizations. We don't have to meet a profit margin for them at all. As well, they're not only public and, non and nonprofit, they get their money substantially from the government. Any year you pick up the newspaper, turn on the radio, and you're going to hear some announcement or other from the federal or provincial government of millions or tens or hundreds and sometimes billions of dollars going into capital infrastructure. And one major area that, is going, that, that, that funding goes to is public transit. So as a society, we're paying the freight. We ought to be able to call the accessibility tune. So for all these reasons, it ought to be doable in a straightforward way. Here's the shocker. I've been involved in advocating now on accessibility one way or another for, for many years as a volunteer, working with many wonderful people. If you're interested in getting involved, just send an email to aodafeedback at gmail.com and ask to sign up for our email list and we'll give you lots of tips on how to do that. If you want to see a record of our campaign, including a fight on the transportation front, um, uh, just go to our website at aodaalliance.org.
or follow us on Twitter at AODA Alliance. Pardon me, at AODA Alliance. Um, but in any event, um, in all the different contexts in which I've done this advocacy, people think, oh, the biggest opponents to advocating for accessibility across the board is probably going to be the business sector. They're going to be worried about their profits and, you know, why are you requiring this? That's not the case. I mean, there's some in any sector who, you know, may um, be skittish, but generally, I will tell you that of the various sectors we've dealt with, the area where I at least have seen the greatest collective resistance has been Ontario's public transit providers. I'm just going to give you a couple of illustrations. In some cases, Canada's. Number one, me and TTC. I, uh, in 1994, I approached the Toronto Transit Commission to ask them to do something which they've been doing for years in Boston and Washington and New York and elsewhere, which is to have their their subway crews announce route stops as you get to them. That ended up in protracted litigation that took to 2005 on and off. And I had to go through a full human rights hearing to force them, to get an order forcing them to consistently and reliably announce all route stops. Now every subway has a crew, every crew member has a mouth, they all have a microphone, and presumably they know what the stops are. So it shouldn't be hard to do. I wasn't asking them to put in any fancy automated system, but you would not believe the fight they put up. When I, just before I won that case, I asked them to also audibly and reliably announce all bus stops. They fought that one too, even after I won the subway case. Now you might think that if you got to announce all when I won in 2005, it was held that the Human Rights Code requires the TTC to announce all, all subway stops for the benefit of blind people. Now you'd think that if they got to do it on the subways, they got to do it on the bus. I mean, it seems pretty obvious, seems obvious to me, probably to you, and I don't know if any of you have had any legal training, but on your first day of law school, that wouldn't be a tough one either. It's obvious to everybody except the TTC. So I had to file a second case, and I won that in 2007. I did a freedom of information request afterwards to find out how much they spent on lawyers in these two cases, fighting against accessibility. I got their legal bills, and between the two cases it totaled $450,000. That's a lot of accessibility that could have been bought by the money they spent on lawyers to lose two loser cases, to oppose something as simple as consistently and reliably announcing all stops. Now, in this lecture series, there will be another lecture on a closer look at those two cases, and I don't have time now to go into them. But they, they're, with that kind of fight over a simple accommodation, an accommodation that helps not only blind people, but sighted people who can't see through a crowd on the bus or subway or through dirty windows or through a snowstorm or when it's dark at night, when it, with so much of a fight over that simple accommodation Imagine what we were fearing for tougher ones. By the way, after I won that case, the Human Rights Commission, to their credit, surveyed all transit authorities to say what they were planning to do about it. Some said they would, some said they wouldn't. Some of them that said they would still didn't uh, announce stops when they uh, said they would. The Human Rights Commission had to start two more legal proceedings after that when the law was clear over something as simple as calling stops. And let me just explain that the, t the, the, the bus stops case, by the time I got to the tribunal, the Human Rights Tribunal, the bus stops case, the TTC had said, we're gonna put in automation. We're gonna put in automated stops announcements, but it's gonna take a couple years. So by then I was arguing at the Human Rights Tribunal that in the interim two years, get your drivers to call the stops. TTC said no, and I won. <laughs> A leading spokesman for London's Public Transit Authority was quoted in the London Free Press when asked if London would also direct their drivers to call stops pending their putting in an automation, automated system. The answer was no. I guess they felt they were above the law or something. I mean, the law was clear. It won the case. 
But another public transit authority, as according to this news report, in substance, felt that they could decide to disregard the law on something that had been hard, you know, fought and lost. Another illustration, a case in the Supreme Court of Canada, this is not an Ontario provider, but national, Via Rail against Council of Canadians with Disabilities. Via Rail decided to go out and spend $134 million on some passenger cars replacing, if memory serves, and I could have this wrong, about a third of their fleet. But the cars they decided to buy, it was argued, were less accessible than the ones they were gonna replace. They were going to use public money to create new barriers. Council of Canadians with Disabilities, a fabulous advocacy group, took them to the Canadian Transportation Agency. Uh, they won their case in substantial part. The Canadian Transportation Legislation has a human rights-like provision. Got fought all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada, and Via Rail lost there too. And that case stands for the proposition, the, in my view, they essentially you can't use your money to create new barriers. That's going to be important in a couple of moments uh, for what happened in Ontario afterwards. But this is an illustration of Via Rail resistance to uh, um, providing accessible public transit. So this is what we've been up against. Um, and it's a sector that's not only demonstrated itself to be, I'm not saying everybody, and I'm not saying always, but collectively through these illustrations and through a process of standards development I'm going to talk about in a moment, a sector that's demonstrated itself to be um, less enthusiastic about doing the right thing than, than, than we would like. And the frustrating part from our perspective is these are public sector agencies who are using public money to resist and a foot drag. It's not their money. It's not their companies. They work for us. So, with all this in mind, along comes the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act, passed in 05. How does it work? It requires the government of Ontario to lead this province to become fully accessible by 2025. That would include making sure all our public transit services are fully accessible by 2025. How's the government to do that? It's required to develop, enact, and enforce accessibility standards to tell organizations what they've got to do and when they got to do it by, what barriers they got to fix and when they got to fix them by. How does that work? The government appoints a standards development committee with representatives from the disability community and the obligated organizations, in this case it would be the transit providers, among others, to come up with proposals for what a new standard would look like in an area that the government wants regulated. One of the first ones the government wanted was transportation. Good job, we agree. In the, in the year, uh, in the 2000s, uh, uh, the Ontario Human Rights Commission had released a report documenting serious barriers in the public transit sector and calling on the government to do something proactive to fix it. And here was a chance to do it. So in 2006, the government appointed a Transportation Standards Development Committee with disability sector representatives and government and uh, transit sector representatives and others. And they sat down to start working on a proposal. The way it works is they, they put their thoughts together, they present an initial proposal, it goes to the public for comment, we comment, they go back and read the comments, and then the Standards Development Committee makes a final proposal. That's sent to the public, we tell the government what we think of it, and then the government decides what to enact. The Transportation Standards Development Committee worked between 06 and if memory serves, I think, around 09, maybe 08. Um, it made an initial proposal in 07 and then got feedback. And then a final proposal in either 08 or 09. All of this is documented on our website and I can't take you through all the chapter and verse, but you can read the proposals and you can read our feedback on them. And then the government of Ontario took all that feedback and finally passed 
a standard that in, uh, it was enacted on uh, J early June of 2011, dealing with a wide range of different areas, one of which is transportation. Let me tell you a little bit about what happened at the Standards Development Committee, and let me tell you what the end result that we got uh, is. <clears throat> These are detailed uh, pardon me, documents worth reading. I'm going to hit on some, some general themes. The first thing I'll tell you is that when the Standards Development, the Transportation Standards Development Committee first met, people with disabilities did not have equal number of seats at the table. The government had set up several different Standards Development Committees, and the disability sector at the table was less than 50%. They were outnumbered and in, the, uh, in a sense they were outgunned because they were either volunteers or coming from voluntary agencies with no staff support in the room. And on the other side of the table would be the organized public transit sector who had access to lawyers and policy people that you and I were paying for through the fare box or your tax returns. And they came in with a pretty solid common front. And it was a common front that was uh, uh, tried to um, argue for um, a very limited range of barriers to be addressed in the standard, for standards for anything that was going to be enacted would be very vague. So it would leave to transit authorities sweeping decisions on what they would do or what they wouldn't do. From the beginning it was clear they were only going to, or they were primarily, the committee was primarily only going to focus on new barriers preventing new ones from being created, not on rectifying the old ones. And there were a couple of stunning things that happened early on. Both, interestingly, relate to the subject of my TTC litigation. It was still ongoing uh, when some of these events were taking place. But I got word that the committee was really having a knockdown drag out over whether uh, they would require all bus and subway stops to be announced. TTC and their fellow transit, public transit authorities were, 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 I guess, holding off against it. The disability community was pressing for it. So I, in my personal capacity, wrote the committee and asked the, standards, the Transportation Standards Development Committee and asked, can I come and meet with you folks just to give you a my pitch, after all, I'm in the middle of this lawsuit against TTC, and I've been dealing with this issue, this issue for a decade. They refused. I got a letter back saying, yeah, sorry, no, we're busy and we're running out of time, or whatever their excuse was. So they were, uh, rather than this being an open process, and remember, this is at a time when the disability sector was a minority. In the, they then, recommended in their initial proposal that yes, route stop should be called out, but that public transit authorities should have how much time to start up this, this service? 18 years. By the way, when I won the case against the TTC in 05 for subway stops and in 07 for bus stops, they were ordered to get it done promptly and in both cases within a couple of months, they got their drivers and their crews making the announcements as they were ordered to do. 18 years. That's just a good illustration of what we're up against. In 07, there was a provincial election. We went to the political parties and argued that, um, uh, that the, the whole process for developing these standards needs to be beefed up. And one of the things we said needed to be done is we needed to have equal seats at the table for people with disabilities or our representatives. The government agreed. Back to memory served, all three parties agreed. We're nonpartisan, we ask all parties for election commitments. Well, this is amazing. The chair of the, of the Transportation Standards Development Committee wrote the minister responsible, this letter's on our website, urging the minister to break that promise. Please don't have more people with disabilities at our table. And as far as I know, it was the only one of the uh, number of standards development committees in operation then that took that position. Needless to say, just after winning an election, the minister was not inclined to uh, break a commitment the premier made in writing to us. And they went ahead. 
The effect was our voice was strengthened and recommendations that came out at the end, while weak, were strengthened. This just gives you a bit of an illustration of what we're up against. Well then, well, let's jump past all this process stuff. What did we get? Well, in the end, we got a, uh, uh, in uh, June of uh, 2011, the Ontario government, to their credit, passed what they call the Integrated Accessibility Standard Regulation, or IASR. That is one big line uh, title. It covered, at the time, barriers in transportation, in employment, and in information and communications. It's since been expanded uh, to cover barriers in public spaces like uh, recreational trails and such things. Before this, in 07, the government already passed a more general customer service accessibility regulation, which, by the way, applies to public transit providers as well as others who provide goods and services to the public. So what's in this standard? Uh, it's, a lot of it's technical. I encourage you to download it and read it. Uh, but I'm going to sort of synthesize it for you. There are two parts of it that matter to you. One part deals with all obligated organizations and one part that focuses specifically on transportation providers. Um, there's a series of obligations that apply either to all organizations that provide goods or services or facilities or at least to public sector ones so that it certainly will capture all public transit authorities. Uh, that Ontario can regulate. This includes an obligation to have a, an accessibility policy and then an accessibility multi-year plan in which they detail not only what they're going to do to address the specific requirements of the regulation, but also what they're going to do to address barriers generally in their service. They've got to make that plan public, and they've got to make, make or, or at least on request, and they've also got to make available an annual status report on what they've done so far. Now these plans aren't, uh, the regulation doesn't specify what exactly they've got to put in it, but it names some topics that have got to be addressed. And uh, the regulation spells out uh, for transit authorities, some additional requirements that they've got to include that other organizations don't, specific to public transit. Now, let me just explain that all of this is helpful. It's helpful because it forces them to go to the table and actually think it through and to write it down and by status reports to actually account for what they're doing. This is, however, not what a, 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 the core of what an access standard was meant to be. An access standard was meant to sit down and tell you, you got to remove this barrier. It may say, here's how you got to remove it, but it also will say when you got to remove it. And it can set different timelines and requirements for big organizations versus small ones, but it's supposed to provide specific actions. These policies and plans leave a lot of flexibility to the transit authority or others to figure out what they want to put in them. Uh, this is also not altogether new. In 2001, four years before the AODA was passed by the McGuinty Liberal government, the prior conservative Mike Harris government had passed a weaker law called the Ontarians with Disabilities Act. That law required all public sector organizations, like public transit authorities, uh, to make public an annual plan about accessibility. It didn't require the plans to be any good. It didn't require the organization to ever act on those plans. And it didn't require them to um, ever account for what they've done in a comprehensive way. You could, under that act, you could write a plan that was one sentence long. I'm going to put a one inch ramp in front of one little curb and that's it. And you'd meet the law. And, by the way, you don't actually have to do that. Fix the ramp or the curb that you refer to. You just have to release a piece of paper saying, uh, you're saying you're going to. And we couldn't enforce it. So the, the requirements uh, in the uh, AODA standard are stronger, and they talk about both making and implementing these plans and providing standards 
uh, pardon me, providing um, uh, status reports on how they're doing. So there's a potential for it to go further, considerably further than the weak Harris government uh, requirements, even though um, plans are different from standards. A standard tells you what you got to do. A plan lets you go back and think about what you want to go do, set it out, and then decide uh, 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 how much, how far you're going to go. Um, and the, one of the difficulties with just a straight planning requirement is each organization, in a sense, has to reinvent the wheel. A standard invents the wheel for everyone. However, some of these limitations are offset by the fact that the the rest of the standard goes into some detail of what transit authorities are supposed to do, public transit authorities. I'm going to talk to you about uh, public transit authorities like TTC. I'll talk to you about requirements uh, for a couple of sort of off-beat things like school boards and ferry services and trains, railways, intercity trains. And then I'm going to talk to you about uh, requirements on municipalities uh, in relation to taxis and bus stops because uh, those are the basic areas that are covered in the specific transit context. Now where the standard turns to the requirements on public transit authorities, it talks about two kinds of services. Conventional services, meaning the transit services that folks are used to seeing, the bus on the street or the subway under the ground that, that folks use. And then it talks about what we conventionally call paratransit, in Toronto called wheel trans. For people who can't use the mainstream system, it's an accessible vehicle, you call up, you have to book a ride, and it's a door-to-door -door service. Um, but unlike the conventional service, it's not available the moment, if you want a bus on Eglinton, you walk out of Eglinton, you wait for the next bus. Maybe it's 10 minutes, maybe it's 15. With paratransit, you gotta call, book a ride, wait online, see if you can get through, um, and who knows whether they've got a ride, ride available when you want it, and then when you're waiting for it, they may not show up on time. Uh, and so on. It's, it's not a comparable level of service at all. Um, the regulation doesn't use the word paratransit, but I'm going to because it's what we know. The standard sets out a series, uh, the first thing I've got to just tell you, this, just as the, has happened in the whole standards development process, the standard predominantly, if not almost totally, only deals with creating new, or preventing the creation of new barriers so that a public transit authority could have lots of old barriers in vehicles that they keep using for the next 20 years until they can't drive them anymore. And there could be aspects of them that could be fixed without undue hardship to the, to the transit authority, something the Human Rights Code would require. And the standard stays si doesn't require them to do that. In fact, at one point it says that it isn't requiring them to retrofit. The only time it requires retrofits uh, is in very limited areas of getting a uh, vehicle and modifying it in some circumstances. Uh, they, they might be required to also provide accessibility in the area they're modifying. It's, it's a very limited, narrow, very constrained, and completely inadequate requirement. So there's a huge lot of barriers that this standard doesn't touch. The standard also does not touch one huge important area, which are public transit stations. Uh, stations where thousands of people go through every day. It doesn't address them at all, whether it's an old station or you're building a new station. They're leaving it to the building code to fix that. The building code, which was just recently upgraded on accessibility, but is chronically out of date on accessibility, does not require any changes in an old building that you aren't renovating. So as long as you keep your old subway station or your old bus station or your old union station and don't do anything to re renovate it, you can leave barriers there forever. And of course, how do you get on public transit without being able to, or get off, without having full access to the stations? Now there are requirements regarding bus stops, we'll talk about in a, sec in a couple seconds. Um, there are a series of requirements technical requirements in the standard for new, newly acquired transit vehicles. And some of them are quite helpful, and, and some are, I mean, they're quite detailed. In some cases, they're nowhere as detailed as we'd like them to be. For example, in the area of lighting and signage, 
we asked for considerably more specificity and detail. And the pushback we gathered from the transit sector is, no, 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 leave it to us to decide. And there's a lot of leave it us to decide in this standard. What is stunning is that the, the standard basically said that if you, got, if you signed a contract for a vehicle before July 1, 2011, its accessibility requirements don't apply. The standard was enacted in June of 2011 to go into effect in July in 2011. But here's the thing, the transit authority was, the transit uh, sector was at the table negotiating these from 06 onward. They knew what was coming. Why on earth would, should they have gone out anywhere between 06 and 2011 and signed a contract with our money for public transit vehicles that fall anywhere short of full accessibility. Especially standards that they were making sure, in a number of cases, gave them a ton of flexibility on, on, on the details. Moreover, even as, it, it's not like it was on, suddenly on, on, on June 3rd or whatever it was, 2011, they all of a sudden found out about these new details the government had released a summary of what they were proposing to put in the integrated standard back at the end of the summer before, in 2010, and they released a draft of this regulation at the start of February 2011. So as late, early, or as late as February 2011, they could know that these, they've got another grace period of five months to run out and sign contracts. Now, I don't know if they did, but clearly there must have been pressure on the government to give them the freedom to. And we said, this is crazy, this totally, remember before I told you about the Via Rail case, I said, get back to it, we're right back to it. This was essentially giving them carte blanche to do what Via Rail in the Supreme Court, the Via Rail case, Supreme Court of Canada said they couldn't do. Now, here's why this was especially stupid, to use a technical legal term. Um, the, when we were negotiating the AODA with the Ontario government, we wanted to make sure that if the standards were weaker than our rights under the Human Rights Code, the standard couldn't trump the Human Rights Code. So, and we, we succeeded in that. Both the AODA and the standards enacted under it recite that where there's two different laws, the one that requires more accessibility prevails. So where this standard purports to give them carte blanche to sign contracts right up to the eve of July 1st, 2011, to buy an inaccessible vehicle, um, it's giving them nothing because it still violates, in our view, the Human Rights Code requirements as expounded on in the comparable provisions of the Canadian Transportation Agency by the Supreme Court of Canada in the, uh, in the Via Rail case. So, I mean, what's going on here? Is, was, the public, was the public transportation sector pressuring for a standard that gave them carte blanche that doesn't really give them carte blanche at all? What possible use would that serve? Other than to, for someone who hasn't got access, uh, a transit authority just reads the standard, thinks that's all they gotta do, and goes and does this, which would be pretty foolish, especially with public money. I just didn't get it. We didn't get it. We didn't understand why they were asking for it, and we didn't understand why the government did it. But we pressed against it, and we didn't succeed. Um, what else is in the standard? There's a number of requirements about maintaining accessibility equipment. Anybody with a wheelchair who goes on the TTC knows that the elevators, can't really count on them. Anybody who needs the escalators to go up the stairs uh, in a subway station knows. Sometimes they work and sometimes they don't. If you're a walking person who can walk up the stairs anyway, it's an inconvenience. If you're a person with chronic fatiguing problems or stamina problems, it means that it can mean the difference in get, getting to where you want to go and not. Um, there are requirements to make this information public about the status of their accessibility equipment. There are a series of added training requirements. The general requirements under the regulation requires all obligated organizations to train their staff on, on the requirements of the accessibility regulation and the Human Rights Code. In other words, they can't just know about the the standard, which may be lower in its demands, they also have to learn to be trained on the Human Rights Code, which in a number of cases is more exacting in our favor. 
Um, but there are also added training requirements for transit authorities, training on using access equipment and so on. Um, in a number of the areas, if you pick up the standard and read it, um, it's quite interesting because as you're reading it, you will probably or should shake your head and say, you had to pass a standard to get them to do this? This is just like good service. Like in the description of the material, I believe it is for steps on a bus, it requires use of slip resistance materials. Now, I'm not saying the public the transit sector was running around looking for buses with sheet ice on their steps. But to me, when I read that, I said, like, I mean, it's great it's there, but um, a lot of this is just plain, basic, good customer service. And all of it is, are, are things that would help um, everybody. Um, I can give you an illustration uh, where the transit authorities must have been pushing to ensure that they had as much discretion as possible. There are times when a driver is driving a bus and a person with a disability is on it, but there's a barrier at the bus stop. And um, so the, the passenger can't get off where they want to go. And normally the driver only lets you off at a stop, not anywhere. And it requires the driver to instead let you off at, at, a, uh, at an appropriate spot that's safe to get off, that's fine. But it leaves it, it's worded so the bus driver totally has the final say. It does require them to consult with the passenger's preference and take it into account. That's nice. But still, they were bending over backwards to try to make sure that the driver um, has carte blanche on this one with the ultimate uh, decision. Um, the um, the standard requires properly signed courtesy seating for people with disabilities. Um, these, are good, these are good things to have. They're all good customer service. The fact that we would need to regulate any of this tells you how much of a, um, how much of a, a challenge, excuse me, achieving accessibility uh, has, has made. Let me be, briefly turn to paratransit. This is a huge issue. This is a huge issue. Um, uh, paratransit, the serv paratransit services in a city like Toronto, and from what I understand elsewhere, are nowhere near comparable. If you have to rely on them, it is nowhere near comparable to the service you get uh, on mainstream. Uh, stories often heard of having to phone and dial and wait and dial to get through, of waiting for a bus. Uh, when the standard came along, it set consistent criteria across the province for qualifications required a prompt application service a system for determining whether you're eligible and provides an independent appeal if you're refused. These are all good. And for the first time, it requires transit authorities to recognize and provide service to visitors to their community who qualified for paratransit in another community in Ontario. That's good. But it then leaves to the transit authority huge discretion over who to decide as a visitor. Well, to my mind, if you're there for one day, you're a visitor. If you've got qualifications, that should be it. It shouldn't be open to them to say, sorry, you've got to be visiting you know, for a month or whatever. I mean, it, it's an example of where they went too far uh, that way. The toughest issue was what kind of guarantee of service. And what our community wanted was at least a guarantee of same day service. You call up or next day service. You call up on Monday, you ask for a ride on Tuesday, you get a ride on Tuesday. And if you want to say we got a call by three o'clock or whatever, that's fine. The transit authorities wouldn't agree. What they got, what we got instead was a guarantee of same day service, uh, uh, next day service, uh, where available. Well, where available means nothing means they'll give it to you if they can, and if they don't, they don't. And you have no recourse. Um, so it's, 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 it's significantly inadequate. The standard does require these transit authorities running paratransit services to put in their access plans strategies to reduce wait times and so on, and that's, 
that's helpful. It requires giving notification of service delays, but that's got to be if it's going to be over 30 minutes. So if they're going to be 29 minutes past the time when they past the 30 minute window when they told you to be available, to be picked up, they don't have to let you know. They don't have to let you know. Um, quickly, uh, okay, quickly, for uh, inner city trains, you're entitled to um, you're entitled to one accessible vehicle, one accessible car per train, one accessible washroom. That's pretty inadequate. Uh, for uh, there's some requirements for ferries and for school boards and so on. Um, but in the end, while helpful, this standard if fully honored and fully implemented, will not achieve a fully accessible public transit system in 2025 or ever. So while it's a step forward and a lot of hurdles had to be overcome, um, it is not anywhere near enough. Let me conclude with just a few up to the minute things. Number one, we are, we have been, and we remain, I believe, significantly behind the United States in accessibility generally, and as a highlight example, in accessible public transit. Not to say the US has got it all right, but they're considerably ahead of us. Number two, even though the new accessibility standard requires organizations like public transit authorities to take into account accessibility when setting up self-service electronic kiosks and procuring uh, goods or service systems to be used uh, by the public generally, they've got to take into account accessibility. Uh, you may know that the government of Ontario sponsored and is actively pressing municipalities to adopt the Presto Smart Card as a single card that you can use to pay fares on various uh, public transit systems. This uh, Presto Smart Card was unveiled a few years ago. You can look at our website we hit the roof because for us it is not a Presto smart card, it is a Presto dumb card. It is full of barriers. For example, if you go to a transit station, you've got your card in your hand, you want to find out what your balance is before you decide about getting on the train or the bus or whatever, you pop it in and at the time it was designed it was going to come up on a screen. Blind people and dyslexic people can't read the screen. There is available access technology to have it also talk. You could have an earphone jack like bank machines have at a number of banks where you pop an earphone in and it speaks you through what's on the screen so you have privacy. When we presented this to the public, and by the way, the, uh, the, the answer uh, that the government uh, initially said is, A, we have a commitment to make it accessible. Well, that's great, but you're not doing it. And B, they said, we've consulted with people with disabilities on the design. Well, the day after that hit the, the public arena, one of the people they consulted who is blind called me and sent me documentation to show that they had been alerted months before that they had barriers in this system. So they committed to accessibility, consulted, and ignored it. And as a result, we get complaint feedback from people with disabilities facing new barriers created with your money in the public transit system with the Presto smart card. Totally avoidable, by the way. It wasn't that they, you know, you might think, oh, did they just go out and buy an off-the-shelf system and no, it didn't provide for these needs? And the answer is no. They had a custom designed with these barriers. Now, we raised this a couple of years ago and they said, oh, we're going to work on fixing it. Um, and we look forward to seeing the unveiling of a fully accessible solution. But I will tell you that I, uh, at the same time, um, some years ago, I think it was 2010, I was on the Chicago subway and I, a friend of mine who's blind demonstrated the, the, the smart card system they have that's been talking and accessible for years. So this can be done. Let me conclude by telling you that this is a huge and ongoing issue. That there is a pressing need to fix this system, uh, it goes without saying that there is a pressing need to effectively enforce these standards goes without saying. It is hugely troubling, as I will address in another lecture in this series, that the government, though it promised effective enforcement of this law in all its areas, not 
just transportation, but across the board. And even though it gave itself enforcement powers under the Disabilities Act, last fall was revealed by us not to be doing really anything to use those enforcement powers at all. And in terms of the customer service standard, not the transit one, you don't have data on that, but in terms of the customer service one, as of last fall, fully 70% of private sector employers with, over, with 20 or more employees were in demonstrated violation of the customer service accessibility standard public reporting requirement. And the government knew it and hadn't taken any enforcement proceedings against any of them as of last fall. So we got some uphill battles to fight. Am I pessimistic? I'm an eternal optimist. I'm totally an eternal optimist. We'll get there. But uh, transportation will be a good illustration of the potential for gains, but the kinds of battles we have to fight to get there. Thank you very much. Okay, so I gave the lecture for an hour, and I promised I would cover one thing, but I didn't get to it. So now, after the fact, I can tag on a little PS or postscript to cover what I should have covered, but time didn't let me cover, and that I promised I'd cover. I said I would talk about uh, some of the requirements uh, that were imposed in the area of public transportation uh, on municipalities by the Integrated Accessibility Standards Regulation that was passed in uh, 2014. Uh, these deal with two areas. Um, accessible bus stops and accessible taxis. They're both really important. Uh, if bus stops aren't accessible, then what's the point riding a bus and getting on it if, if, if you can't get off along, it stops along the way? You could only get off at the station at one end or the other end of the route. So to that end, uh, the uh, Integrated Accessibility uh, Standard Regulation requires municipalities to each consult with their accessibility advisory committee, if they've got 10,000 or more people in their community, they have to have such a committee and, and, and to do a, a disability consultation on um, standards and um, uh, ways to address um, the need to ensure that bus stops and bus shelters are accessible. That essentially requires each municipality to reinvent the wheel rather than doing what we felt the standard should do, uh, which is to require all municipalities to simply uh, do an inventory of those stops and uh, fix them and to set standards for what would be needed to make a stop accessible. It's better than nothing, but it's unfortunate that it requires each municipality to keep reinventing the wheel rather than uh, showing them what they've got to do. Um, the other area relates to t accessible taxi cabs. Now, taxi cabs are hugely important because one can't always uh, get on public transit or it may not be running at the appropriate time. Um, or for a number of other reasons. Now, the taxi industry uh, presents a problem because so many taxis on the road are, um, are not uh, accessible to people with uh, mobility needs. Um, by making them accessible, they, they can accommodate a wide range of, of spectrum of, of people and, uh, and different needs. Um, the taxi industry will argue that cars are owned by individuals uh, often not by the, by the taxi company, sometimes they are owned by the, or the license plate is owned by the taxi company. And they'll also argue that the cost of accessible vehicles is, is, can be considerably higher than that of the, of the actual, um, uh, of a car that you buy that is not accessible. We have felt for a long time that this requires a more concerted strategy at the center. We felt that if the government, which bailed out the auto industry some years ago, had gone to the auto industry and, and said, can we come up with a design for an accessible cab, have the province um, secure purchases of a, a large number of them, way less than are annually actually purchased, but get a bulk discount price, um, that we could drive down the cost of the, uh, the per unit cost of an accessible car and take that concern away from cab owners and cab companies. That's not to say the province actually has to go buy them and then go resell them. If the province could ascertain that, that um, I'm going to make up a number, um, a thousand new cabs are bought every year, then how about going to the, uh, the auto industry and, and coming up with a rate if only 500 are bought? Then any more, that's just gravy. Uh, but, but pick a number that is, that's even less than we know the demand to be. And that can help drive down the per unit cost. Now that would be a strategy potentially in parallel with the AODA. Unfortunately, we haven't seen that, even though we did see that the government is prepared to uh, bail out the auto industry and often 
uh, or I should say at times, do, do uh, take measures to help uh, ensure it stays in Canada. Um, what we, uh, uh, another thing that should make it easier to solve this problem is that every few years, cars <laughs> are traded in. And uh, every year, um, in one community or another, uh, new taxi licenses are being given out by people who don't have a taxi license now, and they're scarce commodities. People want to get a new cab license to put a new cab on the road. Our solution was that the standards should have specified what an accessible cab must include, and it should require that every new taxi license go to, uh, only go to a person who's going to put an accessible car on the road. Therefore, it's not putting a burden on the, uh, on the existing cab owners, but it's going to get more accessible ones on the road. And if anything, the pressure will be on uh, existing cab owners to eventually want to get an accessible car uh, in many contexts so that they can have access to a wider range of customers. Also, a number of municipalities use accessible cabs to help develop deliver paratransit. The more that that happens, and there's a debate over the wisdom of doing that, but the more that that happens, the more um, a, uh, the owner of an accessible cab will have an assured uh, um, and potentially steady supply of customers to make the purchase worthwhile, uh, and so on. In any event, what did we get? We didn't get any of these broad requirements. We got a series of requirements on municipalities. Municipalities usually are licensing cabs. And it provides a municipality to consult where they've got one with their accessibility advisory committee on the number uh, of accessible cabs that they, should, uh, that they need in their community. Um, and then it requires the municipality with, with the usual consultation kind of requirements that are built into the, the, the with the standard. Uh, it requires them, uh, the, the municipality to include in their accessibility plan um, plans for increasing the number of uh, accessible cabs on the road. So it's, it's, and it also requires them to, um, 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 to take certain other measures like dealing with um, the displaying of the uh, the uh, of registration information on the rear bumper. That's so if the person won't take a, a passenger that you can, uh, and if you're sighted, you can track them. And th so that the cab also provides on request accessible information about their uh, identity and registration information. The burden for all of this is placed on municipalities. Um, we therefore are left as disability advocates to have to lobby one municipality at a time um, and that's an un unnecessary and excessive burden. Uh, we thought the standards should have set standards across the province um, uh, rather than leaving it to this sweeping discretion in each municipality. Uh, we got something, we just didn't get anywhere near as much as uh, we would have liked. Anyway, that's the end of the PS uh, and, uh, and the saga of the campaign for accessible public transit uh, continues.